Good afternoon, everyone. Yes. Good afternoon. Welcome to Spelman. I know we have some visitors here today, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you. For those who I have not met, I am pleased to tell you that I am Beverly Daniel Tatum, president of Spelman College, and it's really a, a tremendous delight to welcome you here on this beautiful day to the culminating event of our Cosby Chair, Tanana Reeve Dew. As you may know, if you're wondering, well, what is a Cosby Chair? The historic $20 million gift made by Bill and Camille Cosby in 1988 did several things. It led to the construction of this academic building, named after Dr. Camille Cosby, and the beautiful museum, which is also housed in this building. But it also created an endowment to be used to bring distinguished scholars in the humanities, social sciences, or the arts to our campus for a period of one or two years during which time those scholars known as Cosby Chairs not only introduce our students to their areas of expertise, but they also organize a year-end event that serves as a culminating experience for their residency at Spelman. We have been blessed to have Tana Nareev do here on our campus as a Cosby Chair for the last two years. And we were delighted last year when she organized her culminating program for that year as a celebration of the life and work of Octavia Butler. It was a fabulous program that brought luminaries in the world of speculative fiction to our campus. And now here we are together in this place again, celebrating the arts and activism in the spirit of Octavia Butler. And I'm so pleased that we have had a second year of Cosby Chair Leadership with Tanana Reeve Dew. Thank you so much for all that you've brought to Spelman College. This culminating event brings together the speculative fiction and film communities to discuss the legacy of Octavia Butler, the intersection of Afrofuturism, social justice, and Butler's body of work, and how science fiction can help create a better world. Earlier today, I know there was screening of some science fiction films made for and about people of color, and now we have what I know is going to be a fabulous panel discussion featuring some luminaries again. So I'm going to leave others to do those introductions, but I just want to say what a treat for all of us that you are here. We thank you for being here. And to the audience, I'm so glad you're here to enjoy what is going to be, I know, a very stimulating and enlightening conversation. So without further ado, I'm now going to invite our own chair of the English department, which has been the host to Dr. Tana Nareev Dew, uh, um, our own Dr. Tarsha Stanley, who will come up and tell you a little bit more. Thank you. Good evening. In Afrofuture Females, black writers chart science fiction's newest new wave trajectory. DeWitt Douglas Kilgore posits that we are recognizing an important shift in Africana literary criticism. He writes that speculative fiction, and not social realism, is the moment in which we now find ourselves. That it is speculative fiction which best captures the texture and meaning of the black experience. The texture and the meaning of the black experience. Texture implies something that is both visual and tactile. It can be seen and felt. Meaning is reference denotation, connotation, correlation, and expression. It is possible to find all of that in this moment of speculative fiction, as it is equally possible to find texture and meaning of the black experience in this incredible panel today. Here and now, artists, writers, producers, filmmakers, teachers, and change agents all find a common space in which to collaborate and create and to celebrate the legacy of Octavia Butler. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this very special occasion. I hope I can convey the excitement I feel as Cosby Endowed Chair Professor Tanana Reeve Dew has once again made speculative history by gathering such a group of innovators here this evening. This is part two of her culminating event honoring the great Octavia E. Butler and the legacy she and many others have constructed in the form of a body of work called Black Speculative Fiction. 
Last year, we were heartened by the memories and stories shared by the friends and colleagues of Octavia Butler. We commemorated her life and her work. This year, we moved from mourning to mission as we celebrate the arts and activism inspired by Octavia and her fellow black writers and artists. Speculative fiction is the space which best captures the texture and the meaning of the black experience. I would add that in addition to texture and meaning, we find resonance and amplitude, the dimension and the propulsion by which to span the boundaries, bridges, and backdoor entrances to a space in which we can craft millennial identities and omniversal ways of being that like Octavia Butler's Earth Seed, will take us far beyond the stars. Thank you, Professor Dew. to 
survival position power? They remember old hates and generate new ones. They create chaos and nurture it. They kill and kill and kill. They kill and kill and kill. They kill and kill and kill. Until they are exhausted and destroyed. Until they are conquered by outside forces. Or until one of them becomes a leader most will follow, or a tyrant most will fear. There is no end to what a living world will demand of you. We are earth seed. We are flesh, self-aware, questing, problem-solving flesh. We are the aspects of earth life best able to shape God knowingly. We are earth life maturing, and earth life preparing to fall away from the parent world. We are earth life preparing to take root in new ground. Earth life fulfilling purpose, its promise, its destiny. In order to rise from its own ashes, a phoenix first must burn. Kindness eases change. Earth seed cast on new ground must first perceive that it knows nothing. Embrace diversity. Unite or be divided. divided. Robbed, ruled, killed by those who see you as pretty. Embrace diversity or be destroyed. Once or twice each week, a gathering of earth seed is good and necessary thing. It vents emotion, then quiets the mind. It focuses attention, strengthens purpose, and unifies people. The ground beneath your feet moves, changes. The galaxy moves through space. The stars ignite, burn, age, cool, evolving. God is change. God prevails. <clears throat> the self must create its own reasons for being. To shape God, shape self, as wind, as water, as fire, as life. God is both creative and destructive. Demanding and yielding, sculptor and clay. God is infinite potential. God is change. Your teachers are all around you. All that you perceive. All that you experience. All that is given to you and taken from you. All that you love or hate, need to fear, will teach you if you learn. God is your first and your last teacher. God is your harshest teacher, subtle, demanding. Learn, learn or die. die. Create no images of God, except the images that God has provided. They are everywhere. They are everywhere. They are everywhere. In everything. God, God is change. Seed to tree. Tree to forest. Rain to river. River to sea. Grubs to bees. Bees to swarm. From one, many. From many, one. Forever uniting, growing, dissolving. Forever changing. The universe is God's self-portrait. Thank you so much to panelist Bree Newsom for singing We Shall Overcome and the students from Spelman and Morehouse Colleges for their powerful dramatic reading. Joy Fletcher, Haley Larkins, Javon Davis, Joy Porter, and Kamari Upshaw. Thank you very much for your reading. This is the Octavia Butler Celebration of Arts and Activism. I don't mind if your cell phones are on as long as they don't make noise. Please do tweet with the hashtag Octavia Butler Spellman so we can share this with the world. We are also live streaming. I also want to thank the students from the AUC Alliance for Fair Labor for showing the spirit of activism living on in our young people. Traditionally, young people have always been our leaders and change agents. I also have to give special thanks to Spellman College for this unforgettable opportunity to serve as your Cosby Chair in the humanities. I want to acknowledge the presence of Bill Cosby's nephew, Braxton Cosby, who is uh, here as a science fiction author himself. Braxton, are you in the room or are you selling books? There he is in the back. Thank you for being here, Braxton. In one of my longest conversations with Octavia Butler, when uh, my husband Stephen Barnes and I interviewed her, for a magazine article. She spoke of the impact of the MacArthur Grant on her life. And I know something, I think, of how she must have felt. The spirit of the support here from all of you has been indescribable, and my life will never be the same. Welcome to the Octavia Butler Celebration of Arts and Activism. 
I was raised by two civil rights activists. My father, John Dew, who was present, he prefers to be called a freedom lawyer. <laughs> Still fighting the good fight, running between Mississippi and Florida. You gotta keep an eye on him every minute, especially in Florida, <laughs> I have to say. My, like my late mother, Patricia Stevens Dew, who spent 49 days in jail in a landmark Tallahassee, Florida jail in, in 1960 with her sister Priscilla and other students from Florida A&M University is here in spirit. As an author raised on picket lines and in meetings, I always have been keenly aware of the importance of both arts and activism, and I count myself lucky that I was never discouraged from being a writer, especially a writer who wanted to write about talking cats and spaceships. I'm the only one of my, uh, my parents' three daughters who did not go to law school. But I hoped I would make a contribution in my own way with my pen or my example in breaking down barriers beyond the white only and colored signs that stood in the way of progress for so many generations. Which brings me to this esteemed panel you will see before you tonight. Each of these artists in his or her own way has embraced the challenge of creating change, whether it is through their art or on the streets or both. Like Octavia, they are pioneers who yearn for a better, more just world and future. When I pondered my culminating event at Spelman, I knew I wanted to honor the legacy of Octavia Butler as we did last year with a panel of her friends and colleagues and teachers. But some of today's panelists have never met Octavia Butler. They never had the opportunity, but they do carry on her spirit. I thought of the 1959 workshop my mother attended, by the, uh, sponsored by the Congress of Racial Equality, where she first met Dr. King. But more importantly, she was presented with a plan. And with that plan, she and her sister went back to that FAMU campus and helped spark a citywide march toward freedom. This year, marks the 50th anniversary of Freedom Summer, the murders of James Cheney, Andrew, Andrew Goodman, and Mickey Schwerner, and other activists whose names we did not learn, the Civil Rights Act, and countless other milestones communities suffered and fought for across this nation. And if you don't leave here today with a plan, at least I hope you will be inspired to help build a future Octavia's work so passionately tried to steer us toward as she pointed out our failings through the metaphors of her futuristic fiction. Gone are the blatant symbols of racism and oppression that marked my parents' generation. We have been left with the insidious post-racial society that hides its racism and its school-to-prison pipeline, its war on drugs, its police practices, its immigration policies, and its contempt for our struggling communities. The first step toward change is to understand that there must be change. As we walk like zombies glued to our smartphones, and I'm talking to myself too, we cannot forget that we live with only the illusions of equality and freedom left in the wake of the progress won by people like my parents. The previous generation took the first steps. Now it is our turn to walk. Panel, as I call your names and say a few words about you, please make your way to the stage. Adrienne Marie Brown, one of our emerging artists. Adrienne has been directly inspired to community action and care through her love for the work of Octavia Butler. She is a 2013 Kresge Literary Arts Fellow writing science fiction in Detroit, also received a 2013 Detroit Night Arts Challenge Award to run a series of Octavia Butler-based science fiction writing workshops. She's the co-editor of the forthcoming anthology Octavia's Brood, Science Fiction from Social Justice Movements with Walida Imarisha, which comes out in June. Adrian has helped to launch a loose network of Octavia Butler and emergent strategy reading groups for people interested in reading Octavia's work from a political and strategic framework and, it's building, and is building the Octavia E. Butler Legacy Network on other ways to extend her work. Thank you so much, Adrian. Juno Diaz. Juno Diaz, born in the Dominican Republic, raised in New Jersey, is the author of the critically acclaimed Drown, 
The Brief Wondrous Life of Oscar Wilde, which won a 2008 Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Critics Circle Award. And This Is How You Lose Her, a New York Times bestseller and National Book Award finalist. I have read them all. Among other awards, he's a recipient of a MacArthur Genius Fellowship, Guggenheim Fellowship, and a Penn O. Henry Award, a graduate of Rutgers College. He's currently the fiction editor at Boston Review and the and Rudge and Nancy Allen Professor of Writing at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He's also co-founder of the Voices of Our Nation workshop, VONA, a writing workshop for writings of color. And as Cosby Chair, I sponsored three students there last January. In December, he sat in conversation with Nobel Prize winner Toni Morrison at the New York Public Library event. He's appearing at 6.30 tomorrow, we were so lucky to get him, at Georgia Tech to lecture on education and immigration in the United States, Juno Diaz. <laughs> Dream Hampton. Dream Hampton is a writer, <laughs> award-winning filmmaker and social justice organizer in addition to the films Black August and I Am Ali. She directed the music video Queens that we screened earlier at the Black Science Fiction Short Film Showcase. NPR named it one of the most stylish music videos of 2012. Hampton has written about music, culture, and politics for more than two decades. She was a contributor to Vibe Magazine for its first 15 years. Her articles have been published in The Village Voice, Spin, The Detroit News, Harper's Bazaar, NPR, Essence, and Ebony. Her essays have also been included in more than a dozen anthologies, including Born to Use Mics, Reading Nasa's Illmatic, and Black Cool, 1,000 Streams of Blackness. Hampton collaborated with Jay-Z on the New York Times bestselling book, Decoded. She's a consultant at Moms Rising and a board member for the National Civil Rights Organization Color of Change. She also serves on the boards of Young Nation, Detroit, Summer, and Wright, write a house in her hometown of Detroit on April 30th at Stanford University. She will appear in conversation with Harry Belafonte on the theme of social justice. That is Dream Hampton. John Jennings. John Jennings. Whose lovely prints you have seen on display in the lobby is an associate professor of visual studies at the State University of New York at Buffalo. His research and teaching focus on the analysis, explication, and disruption af of African American stereotypes in popular visual media. His research is concerned with the topics of representation and authenticity, visual culture, visual literacy, social justice, and design pedagogy. He's an accomplished designer illustrator, cartoonist, award-winning graphic novelist, and he's also the co-author of the upcoming graphic novel adaptation of Octavia Butler's classic dark fantasy novel, Kindred, along with his longtime collaborator, Damian Duffy, which will be published in 2015. That's John Jennings. <laughs> Nettie Okorafor. The American-born daughter of Igbo Nigerian parents, her novels and stories reflect both her West African heritage and her American life. Okorafor is a 2001 graduate of the Clarion Writers Workshop and holds a PhD in English from the University of Illinois. She received a 2001 Hurston Wright Legacy Literary Award for her story Amphibious Green, then published two acclaimed books for young adults, The Shadow Speaker and Zara the Windseeker. Zara won the Wally Shrianka Prize for Literature in Africa. The Shadow Speaker was a winner of the Carl Brandon Parallax Award, a Book Sense Pick, and a Tip Tree Honor Book. A core for his children's book, Long Juju Man, was the winner of the Macmillan Writers Prize for Africa. Her first adult novel, Who Fears Death, which we read here at Spelman in our Butler's Daughters course, I co-teach with Dr. Stanley, won the 2011 World Fantasy Award for Best Novel, addressing real-world issues like female genital mutilation and war rape. In 2011, she returned to young adult fiction with Akata Witch, which was on the American Library Association's Amelia Bloomer Project list, honoring children's books with feminist themes. Her short stories have been published in anthologies and magazines, and she published a collection of her short stories, Kabu Kabu, in 2013, and she read from her newest novel, Lagoon, which just came out in April, earlier today. That's Nnedi Okorafor. <laughs> and last, Bree Newsom. We heard her singing earlier. She is another of our panel's emerging artists. Her short horror film, Wake, which we screened at our Black Science Fiction Short Film Showcase, 
uh, this year and last year has won numerous awards and she directed wrote that while she was a student at NYU it was selected for the official competition in NYU's prestigious first run film festival where it went on to win numerous awards including an audience choice award uh, and craft awards for producing art direction and acting it also it was also named as a finalist for the festival's highest honor the Wasserman Award she screened her film at the Directors Guild of America in Hollywood the National Board of Review of Motion Pictures recognized Wake as one of the best student films of 2010 and awarded Newsom a student grant she went on to several film festivals including the Cannes Film Festival and won BET's Urban World top honors in 2011 She's the front woman for Powerhouse, a Charlotte-based funk and R&B soul band while continuing to work as an activist and youth organizer in North Carolina. She was arrested at a sit-in in July of 2013. She and five other protesters were arrested while protesting changes to North Carolina's voter ID law that restrict voting. I know the introductions were long, but I want you to know who you're listening to. Ladies and gentlemen, our panel. I'm going to set it off and then I'm going to take a seat. But uh, panelists, before I ask my questions, I want to hear from you. And I'll start with Adrian, because Adrian facilitates around the country on this topic. T um, uh, after Adrian, you do your thing, and then the rest of the panel would like you to tell us briefly in about five minutes why you're here, why it matters to be here, and an Octavia Butler celebration of arts and activism. Take it away, Adrian. Hi, I'm very excited to be here. I'm trying to act normal sitting on the panel. So I'm doing good so far though, right? Um, so my name is Adrian Marie Brown. I am a social justice facilitator. I've spent about 17 years doing different kinds of work in the social justice and activist realm. And throughout that time, I was reading Octavia Butler's work and very, 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 very much turning to her as a prophet, as a strategist, as a guide for my work but then feeling like I had to kind of be in the closet about that because I was a serious activist and reading science fiction didn't really have anything to do with that. Um, and a few years ago, I started having conversations with other people about the fact that Octavia was really leading my work and found that there were actually tons of other people who similarly felt influenced by her. And, um, and she gave us you know, a, a different way of thinking about leadership. What does leadership actually look like? In most of the work that I've done for most of that organizing, it has been replication, replication, replication of the status quo. It's just been watching people be hierarchical, patriarchal, sexist, um, white supremacist, and, and all of those things, but in all these like polite, nice ways, because we're activists and we're like, you know, we're radical, we're changing the world together, but still enacting all these power dynamics. And Octavia writes case study after case study of what leadership can look like if it's done through a lens where people of color are centered, um, people of color are in leadership, women are centered, women of color are in leadership. And then we let go of some of the ideas that we've had about who can lead and who can create change. I think Octavia was a great living example of this. I got to meet her briefly uh, when I was in college. And if any of you have seen videos of her or seen her, she doesn't look like what we are told is a leader in this world. Um, she was somewhat socially awkward. She was tall. She was dark-skinned. She had an underbite. She had this deep, gorgeous voice. I mean, people didn't know, like, who did she like to have sex with and what did she do? And all this stuff was a question. And when I met her, I was just blown away by her presence. Um, but that's n maybe not the reaction she'd had for most of her life. And so now, a lot of the work I do centers around that. How do we actually tune into people who we don't think of when we look at them? We're not told they are the model for what leaders look like, and this is who's changing the world. How do we actually tune in and say, these are the people who we most need to listen to, who have the most innovative and imaginative stories? So I'm co-editing an anthology of work uh, with uh, Walida E. Marisha called Octavia's Brood. And it's people who are doing social justice work who are writing science fiction and speculative fiction for the first time, most of them, and it's brilliant. And what the, what the process has shown me is that almost every single person, so far everyone I've met, I haven't met anyone yet, but I always want to leave the chance out there, but so far everyone has worlds, worlds and worlds within them. You just have to learn to listen and how to ask those questions. So 
I'm actually going to have you all do something very briefly that gets us in the right mood. Because I know that it's easy to come to something like this and be like, oh, there's brilliant people up here, and then these you know, boring old people sitting next to me in the audience who are just normal like me. So we're going to just flip that script, right? So I'm going to ask everyone, if you feel comfortable standing, to stand up. Great. All right, so standing, and y'all are standing too? That's so great. OK, so uh, you never know what to expect when you look backwards. Um, all right, so you're standing up. That if you feel comfortable, if you don't at any point have a seat because that's your body being really brilliant. So the first thing we want to do is a lot of times we come into these spaces just with our minds, right? So I want you to close your eye, and if you can think of it almost closing your mind, and just tune into your body. Your body is in this space. Many of the bodies in this space were never meant to make it. We were not meant to survive, and yet somehow we were here. Our ancestors had visions of us existing. They didn't know how it would look, but they kept creating us. And they kept looking for freedom, seeking it like water, going to the furthest place down that they could to find their way. And somehow we made it. So just be grateful for a second. If your body feels sore, if your body feels tense and tight, if you had a hard time getting here, if your body is aging and you can't believe your hair is turning gray, or if you're just very, very young in this new body that you think is going to last forever, just be super grateful for whatever b beautiful, gorgeous and miraculous body brought you into this space today. And just feel that gratitude towards yourself. Good. You all look better immediately. Drop your shoulders. Let your skeleton do its job. It's a beautiful skeleton. It's a great one. You have a very good one, OK? So just let it hold you. Put your feet about shoulder width apart. That's a more balanced position. And then let yourself drop closer to the ground, drop into the earth. Gravity is our friend. Right? It keeps us on this planet. So far, we don't know any other place to survive. So this is a good one. And we have to be loving towards it and grateful to be here. Good. So now just turn to the person next to you. And when I say turn, I mean your whole self. So you're heart to heart with this person. All right? If you don't have a person, look around and find one. <laughs> find a person. Not nothing yet. OK, if you can hear the sound of my voice, stop talking. Very good. Great. So now, you're not going to say anything to this person, because that would be going back to your mind space. All right? We're just body to body right now. And I dressed up to look nice for you all. And I'll be, be here afterwards. But right now, I want you to look at each other. All right? Look at the person in front of you. If you feel comfortable, look as hard as you can. Look with as much focus as you can. All right? So if it makes you feel awkward, just let that flow through, giggle, work it out. As humans, we don't pay attention to each other at this level. We think we're going to change the world. We think we understand humans. But we can't even be quiet for a moment and tune in to each other. Look at this miraculous being in front of you. This is someone who has some intention in the world. Maybe you know what it is, maybe you don't. Octavia says, all that you touch, you change. All that you change, changes you. The only lasting truth is change. God is change. To shape God, shape the self. Right? So I just want you to look at this person and imagine that the change that they're here to create, your job is just to support that happening just for a second, that you're supposed to give them some burst of energy, some little psh, magic, and just give it to them, whatever that looks like for you. Oh, yeah, you guys are good. You're throwing energy at each other. You're giving each other hugs. All right? All right. Now, if you can hear the sound of my voice, I didn't say to sit down. All right? Now, you're going to share one thing with this person. One thing. So they can hold their accountability about being the person who's helping you make this. What is, in a few words, what is it you're here to change? What are you here to change, personally? On this planet, in this world? Yeah. In this whole world, your existence.
Just a few words. All right, make sure to switch people if you have it. What are you here to change? I don't know how to, how to use change in the world, but I want, I want people to recognize it. Good. And when you're done, just look awkwardly in my direction. Okay, so now you've heard it from each other. Now, if you didn't get to get it all out, because you are one of the people who has more words for the things that you need to express, which is fine, that's good too. Just now this person can be your person. You can exchange numbers, you can be friends, right? Just consider that by telling this person and articulating and letting it be known in the universe that it's gonna come to be, right? So you let them say, you say, may it be so. May it be so, all right? Okay, now you can really let each other go and sit down. Um, how was that? Was good? So we'll get to talk a lot more um, about the different work that I do, but one of the main things is that I do work around something called emergent strategy. Emergent strategy. So instead of strategy as we've been taught through sort of military lineage as trying to come up with what is the best plan to dominate and win and move forward, emergent strategy is based in the concepts of nature, right, emergence. And Octavia's leaders all have this. We have to be adaptive, relational, decentralized, interconnected, interdependent. So that exercise is one we've been doing all over the country with different groups of organizers, activists, artists, and other, other things like collective sci-fi writing, visioning. And the idea is to move people from a place of strategy that is designed to win to strategy that is designed to emerge and evolve. How do we put ourselves in right relationship with nature? And then Reading Octavia helps us. And I just want to shout out the NOLA crew who took the bus here. This is our Wild Seeds, Wild Seeds Coven from New Orleans who are meeting and reading Octavia politically. Thank you so much, Adrian. That was so beautiful and so healing. I, I feel the stress rolling off. <laughs> Our other panelists, feel free to, to speak in any order you like. Just a little bit about <laughs> what, why you're here. What did you say when you talked about what you wanted to change, or just a little bit about yourself? <laughs> or... <laughs> Someone ready? Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to keep getting up. I have a really bad back, so I always feel weird. It's, it always seems like I'm going to catch the spirit or something. Um, <laughs> but uh, I just uh, wanted to thank everyone who made this possible. I want to thank my fellow panelists. It was a great honor to be here with all of y'all. And everyone who came out, I can only imagine uh, some of you, what you gave up to come here folks who came up on the bus, damn. <laughs> that is no joke, man. Yeah, man, I really appreciate it. And of course, to our like fearless leader, yeah, yeah. Professor Du, who made this. <laughs> Honestly, I mean, I, I feel like if I, I don't know, if we had like three of you, this shit would be a wrap, <laughs> you know? So I guess very quickly, I, um, uh, my name is Juno Diaz, I'm a writer, and um, I think uh, part of what sort of brought me here um, both has to do with sort of the time I came out of. I'm 45, so if you do the math, I came up during the time that uh, Octavia Butler's books were being published. Um, her books were comi coming out uh, basically as I was, you know, coming of age and in many ways the zeitgeist that informed you know what was happening in the world that informed a lot of her books we were sort of those of us who were alive at that time were not only coming out of that same sort of historical movement uh, historical moment but I think found ourselves in many ways uh, reflected in her books in ways that we weren't reflected anywhere else um, I was one of those, what they call what, an early adapter. You know, adopter, I think it's early adopt. 
Yeah, I could never <laughs> get it right. <laughs> Is it? Yeah, whatever. The, I, you know, I was reading her young um, completely because I had a, a really awesome librarian, not because I was particularly smart. Um, and I think that uh, part of the reason I come here um, not only has to do with the fact that that historical moment, that zeitgeist, which uh, Octavia Butler was both responding to and speaking with, in many ways produced uh, me as an activist. Uh, I have a sideline that I'm a writer, but really for most of my, you could say most of my quote unquote career, I was an activist. Most of my friends were shocked to find out that I was a writer because they just knew me as somebody who stuffed envelopes and you know, went on marches and stuff like that. Um, and I think that there's something very telling about the period in which Octavia Butler was writing um, that still speaks to me. Um, the 80s, you guys remember, those of you very clearly, this was a time of apartheid in South Africa. This was a time of the first intifada uh, with Israel and Palestine. This was the time of the genocidal U.S. back wars in Central America. You know, we throw around the word genocidal, but I mean, the United Nations is not particularly known as a very liberal organization. And even they have designated those wars as genocidal. Um, and I grew up in a neighborhood where a lot of the, the folks um, who were coming out in many ways, the sort of the victims of those wars were washing up in our neighborhoods. A lot of people who had been driven out, had been put in exile, a lot of people had to flee their communities that had been bombed and burnt out. And at the same time, this was the Reagan period of the urban double nightmare of crack and AIDS. Um, and I grew up in a poor community, predominantly African-American and Latino, and sort of was watching this stuff and living this stuff front lines. And in many ways, my activism comes as a response to all of these things, both my sense of internationalism, but my also, you know, my deep, deep commitments to the continuities of our civil rights movements and our feminist movements and our um, third world feminist movements. And a lot of these things, again, I found myself um, in many ways, my Bible and my mirror and my song and my friend and my pen and my vehicle were the works of Octavia Butler in a very powerful way. And I, just to finish up, um, I think one of the things that continues to haunt me with, uh, always to this day is that I had, like many of our panelists, I had met Octavia Butler a number of times um, through uh, my friendship with Samuel Delaney. But the one time that I was supposed to interview Octavia Butler, to do a long, long interview with her, I showed up to the place where we were supposed to be interviewing, and I could not find her. And she showed up to a place and she could not find me. And we both spent an hour in two different places looking for each other. And we never met. And we were never able to do that interview. Even though I had met her and I knew her, um, the interview continues to haunt sort of like my dreams. I have so many dreams, for real, where I am interviewing Octavia Butler, the interview that never, never happened. And I often think that most of us, whether we've read her or have not read her without knowing it, are living that moment, which is what would Octavia say next? What would Octavia write next? And what would it mean just to spend a little time in a conversation with such a towering, important figure to African diasporic letters? And so I think of that, and I think part of the reason I'm here is because in the echoes of our dialogues, I'm really kind of hoping to hear her again, as always, you know? That's it, thank you. Um, all right, my name is Dream Hampton. Um, like Juno, I'm a couple years younger than him. Um, I grew up reading Octavia as she kind of came out. Um, when Parable, was released, I can remember, this was back when there were black bookstores, you may have heard of them <laughs> if you're young, um, but they used to be a real thing. Um, 
And in New York, well, actually in Detroit, I think I bought it at the Shrine of the Black Madonna. Um, I was home for a visit. Um, and I remember um, reading, uh, like buying it, but not wanting to um, get in my car to drive home. I wanted to start reading it then, like I didn't, so I sat in the store until they closed <laughs> and began reading Parable of the Sore at the bookstore. Um, Octavia has always meant a great deal to me. I absolutely identified with Lauren Olamina at the time. Um, I think that by that time I had tried out, like a prisoner, you know, I had tried out a bunch of different religions. <laughs> you know how your your cousins or brothers go to prison and then they like discover the nation of Islam and then they discover real Islam and then, <laughs> then they might become a Rasta or something. Like I had gone through that <laughs> whole journey um, and was questioning, you know, what I believed in in terms of spirituality. So that book was a huge, um, just a lamp for me um, in terms of lighting a particular path. Um, I mean, everything that Juno said about our generation and its zeitgeist, absolutely. Um, I mean, I went to DC as a 10th grader to, uh, in a debate club from Detroit, from Cass Tech to argue the Sandinista's position. Um, my very first action was showing up at a gas station when I was um, 11 with my own handmade sign at Shell. I didn't know then that like the people who own the individual stations aren't Shell. <laughs> um, but I, Shell was the only, well not the only, but one of the more um, visible companies who refused to divest from South Africa. And because Stevie Wonder had told me it was terrible. Um, and you know, of course, that's how I learned about apartheid and, and because of Winnie and her um, strong and courageous voice and tours and that's how I learned about her husband and, and went on to read Biko and and just that entire education um, so yeah I, I was standing up in in the freezing cold in Detroit um, with my sign that you shouldn't buy gas here um, because they support apartheid and I remember people from Detroit being like what's, what, what's apartheid <laughs> and like I was like telling them you know um, so that was my very first action um, by the time Parable had come around, I was in New York. I was a film student at NYU. Um, I was largely at NYU because of Kubrick's 2001, um, a film that had also been very important for me growing up. We, um, I was at, at film school, but I was also in a city that was dealing with incredibly severe um, like militarization. Um, and they were experimenting on black bodies in terms of uh, how they would spread this militarization throughout different police departments. In fact, this summer, the NYPD will be coming to Detroit to teach them how to stop and frisk. It wasn't called stop and frisk then, but um, we were dealing with incredible police brutality in the early 90s in Detroit. And, and, and some friends and I um, founded the New York chapter of an organization called the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, which is, of course, very active here in Atlanta. Um, yes. <laughs> um, and as I was reading Parable, I was trying to imagine new ways to be um, a phrase that we use in Detroit, leaderful, you know, um, to, to, to break out of like hierarchical patterns. Because at that point, we had our elders who were kind of mentoring us, beautiful people like Shokwe Lumumba, the late mayor of Jackson, Mississippi. Um, who were mentoring us, but we also were seeing that they had beefs that some of them, they didn't talk to like some organization that they had beef with over some COINTELPRO pro, pro stuff from the 70s. And you know, we'd see each other at a Yusuf Hawkins march and they'd be ready to fight still. You know, so we were trying to imagine ways to break out of, of those old paradigms. Um, and Octavia's work again was important to me. Um, back in Detroit, is anyone here from Detroit? I know my boy Spive is from Detroit. Um, we used to have a DJ called Mojo. Um, as you know, Elijah Muhammad imagined that there was this mothership um, that would take us all to another galaxy. And, and Elijah, um, and of course, Elijah Muhammad began the Nation of Islam in Detroit. But uh, we had this DJ, Mojo, who um, founded Prince um, in a lot of ways. And Prince gives him credit for that. And he would have these like late night shows about the mothership landing. And I was so young, I used to really stay up super late. I mean, eight years old, up at like two in the morning looking for the mothership, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, I mean, 
I don't know, that's a little bit about my history, why I'm here. I always think about truth, and, and when I think about my generation, which of course brought us hip hop, I think about um, just the limitations of what truth is and, and what keeping it real can mean. And, and I think about Sun Ra, who says that, um, you know, what I'm dealing with is so vast and great that it can't be called the truth, it's above the truth. Um, so all of those things I bring to this panel, and I look forward to this discussion. And, and Dr. Do, my God, you're like Alice Walker to, um, to Zora Neale Hurston. I mean, the work, the, the, the care taking that you've done of Octavia's legacy is so inspiring, and thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> oh, I, I made some notes because I don't want to ramble. I ramble. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, my first thing is thank you uh, for having me. It's an incredible honor uh, to be here, um, representing such a wonderful uh, talent um, in Octavia Butler and her work. And um, you know, I was uh, been in dialogue with her actually for the last like um, year or two because again, I'm co-adapting you know Kindred into a graphic novel, and so having to live with this woman's words and to um, really try to different to kind of differentiate some of the different connotations of that particular narrative, which is such a powerful story, um, has been an honor. And I'm, I'm very excited about working on that project. I'm sorry, I also don't talk loud, sorry. Um, I was thinking about uh, uh, James Baldwin's quote, artists are here to disturb the peace, right? Um, I teach my students how to be disturbing, you know? I always tell them, like, I want to educate you, but I want, I want to weaponize you as well. I'm from Mississippi. I was born in 1970 in the shadow of a lot of the racialized violence that have happen, had happened in the South, right? And so I'm kind of a unicorn. I'm not supposed to be here, as, uh, as Adrian was talking about. You know, like the, we've all gone through particular struggles. Uh, one of the things um, that led me to education was the fact that my grandfather was, you know, totally illiterate, right? Believed in the power of education, but actually couldn't read or write himself and actually used an X. I know it sounds very cliche, but he actually used an X to sign his name, right? And so when I think about like the opportunities that could that he could have had, I actually start I started to imagine what his life would have been like. You know, I actually still do this, if you know he actually had access to those types of spaces, right? So I started to create you know these types of narratives very early on. My mother uh, uh, was a was a huge science fiction and fantasy uh, um, reader. I'm actually uh, really actually horror too. She totally ruined me very early on. <laughs> And uh, she was one of my first artists that actually I got a, that I was inspired by. She made quilts and dresses, and and actually at the time I was like, oh, that's girl stuff. That's not, uh, you know. But no, she was an, she's an artist, right? And so was my grandmother, who also was actually very much into um, these like tr traditional folkloric traditions um, that are kind of like rooted in particular uh, diasporic, you know, uh, culture, right? That I didn't recognize at the time. And so a lot of the work that I've been doing recently have been delving into those areas. Um, I'm a I'm a curator. Um, I'm also, um, you know, a, a cultural critic, and I do a lot of like um, edited pieces on representation in popular culture. Uh, one of the things that I really am inspired by, by um, Octavia's work, is she talks. She has, in some of her interviews I've seen, I've never had the opportunity to actually physically meet her, but um, she talks about writing her, writing herself into a space that she loved that actually didn't represent her, right? And so this notion of the power of representation is something I'm very, very uh, into. Uh, I teach a class called uh, Semiotics and Visual Rhetoric at the University of Buffalo, which is about the science of understanding images, right? And so last year I taught this class called um, Race as uh, Science Fiction. And so basically ex ex exposed my students to this notion of this kind of fictionalized idea of what race is and how it designates, um, you know, different types of uh, hierarchies, right? And this is a mostly, you know, white and Asian class, right? But there were eight black students in the class, which is a lot for an art class in that space. And so the, to, to see the dynamic shift as far as when, to see a class that actually is focused on their, you know, folklore, on their, on their spaces and on their ideas was just extremely powerful. Um, some of the things I've been into re uh, recently besides uh, doing graphic novels and such, I'm, I also organize and facilitate spaces as well. Recently I did this piece with um, Dr. Adelifu Nama at Loyola Marymount called Astro Blackness, which some of the people on the panel were at. Thank you so much again. Um, which was basically talking about these these issues around uh, you know black spectral spaces and you know these these notions of like you know of agency and representation. Um, I'm also very much into social entrepreneurship, uh, using um, these ideas to kind of empower people through different modes of, of entrepreneurship. Um, when I was at University of Illinois, I actually 
co-created this class called EDGE, which is an acronym for Ethics of the Designer in a Global Economy. And um, I really believe in training designers, because a lot of you guys probably like know what a graphic designer is, but you know, we shape and sculpt you know, the, the visual landscape. It's a social space, right? And so a lot of times, you know, we are kind of hired to be like graphic go-boys and go-girls, where you're just kind of creating these things for a client. But um, we have agency, and we, I'm really big, this idea of like the, 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 art, the artist as, as, um, as author, you know, so authorship, citizenship, and creating this notion of the citizen designer is something I'm really into as well. And so a lot of my uh, work is dealing with um, really imagining those particular spaces and then what can kind of transpire once you've actually opened the door to students about that type of agency. So, and that's why I'm here, and I, I'm very thankful to be here. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I think for me, I would have had a very hard time getting here if it weren't for Octavia Butler. That's why I, I'm really glad um, to see myself here. The reason why I say that is because when I first started writing, I didn't, first, I discovered Octavia in the year of 2000. And um, before that, I had been, I'm a, I'm a direct product of creative writing programs. I started writing when I was 20. And um, in those classes, my professors knew early on that I had a gift for storytelling. But at the same time, like I said, I'm a product of um, creative writing programs. So those professors were discouraging me from writing science fiction and fantasy. They kept saying, you know, we want you to write real um, real literature. You can write real literature. Don't write that other stuff with the weird stuff in it. So, um, so I, for years, I was struggling with that. The weird stuff kept wanting to pop up in my work. It naturally did. And my professors kept suppressing it. And then in the year 2000, I went to a, um, a science fiction and fantasy workshop called the Clarion um, Clarion Science Fiction and Fantasy Workshop. It's a six week, it's still going. Um, the one that I went to was at Michigan State University and it's six weeks, six weeks long and each week has a different professor or a different instructor. And uh, in one of those weeks, Stephen Barnes happens to be one of my instructors as well, which is cool. Um, so during that six weeks out of, I think there were about maybe 19 or 20 students or 20, you know, 19 or 20 writers in this workshop and I and my, my I and one other uh, writer were the only black people in my group. So, um, so there was that. And <laughs> as that was happening, you know, so we, we would have different, we, we workshop different stories every single day and all of that. And so there were cer certain issues like the issue of the magical Negro popped up um, during these workshops. And, and because of the way the group was structured, things weren't discussed, except during Steve's week, <laughs> things, weren't, things weren't properly discussed. So, I, so we had all these things going on. We have my, my whole creative writing workshop experience going on. And um, so this was the first time I was trying to see if I was really a science fiction and fantasy writer. So during the time where I was at the workshop, we went to the bookstore. And I was going through the science fiction and fantasy section. I go through all the sections in bookstores, so eventually I made it to the science fiction and fantasy section, and I saw a book with um, something, I saw a, a very big rarity in that section. And it, was, it had the cover facing out. I stopped and looked at this cover in awe because it had a black person on the cover. <laughs> I had no idea who Octavia Butler was at the time. This was 2000, once again. And um, I bought that book. This, the, that's the power of covers. I bought that book. And um, I took it, took it to my dorm room and started reading. And the book that I bought was Wild Seed. It was called Wild Seed. And <laughs> I started reading, and um, I'm of Nigerian background, and Wild Seed started in Nigeria. And I'm like, oh my God, and, you know, I was like, oh, <laughs> you know. So I, I, there are two things that I couldn't believe that were happening here. It was like, first you got the black person on the cover, then it's taking place in Nigeria, and I was like, my head was exploding already. <laughs> and so I, I ended up reading that book um, probably within that week while I was supposed to be writing other stories, but I was reading that. And so when I finished reading that book, my mind was stretched 
to, it was stretched so much that it was, you know when you stretch something and it never returns to the same shape it was before? <laughs> That's what Wild Seed did for me, and um, because it was just doing so many things I'd never seen done before. And as a as a young black uh, uh, writer of whatever I was writing, science fiction, fantasy, whatever, reading something like that, seeing those kinds of characters telling that kind of story was earth shattering for me. It was it was not only was it a great story, not only was it just you know that kind of book that, that reads so smoothly, you, you, it's just, you lose yourself in it. So not only was, was there that, but just to see those images as a writer was deeply affecting to me. It, it showed me that, it showed me that it was okay to write what I was writing. Because up until that point, I had never seen anyone, anyone else doing it. And, there, and there's something to be said about that. To be able to see someone else doing what you hope to do, it's like, it, it just gives you this sort of permission that I didn't have before. So that was like the beginning of so much for me, just discovering that book. And of course, after that, um, a few things happened. One, I went on to grab anything else that she'd, that she'd written and consume it like candy. So I did that, but also um, I had, I had ho been holding the book and one of my instructors had looked at it and said, oh, she taught at this, this workshop. And, I, and me being who I am, very aggressive sometimes, I um, said, can I talk to her? <laughs> can you get her on the phone? And so that led to my first conversation with Octavia. And so, um, so over the years, you know, I had like, there, there were on and off conversations that I'd have with, with her every so often for different reasons. And one of them that I most remember was about, yeah, a year later, right after 9-11 happened, we were both online and I had her email address and we were exchanging emails as that was happening and we just kind of talking about what we thought was gonna happen and um, what we thought was happening. And I remember that she did not have good things to say about President Bush, that was one. <laughs> she had terrible things to say about him. And then also, we were both very pessimistic, you know, and, and I kept those conversations and those were eventually published in an anthology, which name I can't remember right now. But, um, so there's that. And then eventually I, I got to meet her in person uh, when she came to Chicago State University. Um, I think it was, it was months before she passed. And um, she came to speak there, and I always remember that because one, of course, I got to meet her in person and we had a nice little conversation. But, but what I most remember was Chicago State is, it's not, an, uh, it's not officially a historical, historically black university, or yeah, historically black, black university, but it is a black university, it really is. And um, it's on the south side of Chicago, yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so when she came, what was so heartening was that we have, it was during the Gwendolyn Brooks Writers Conference when they used to have it, and um, when she came to speak, it was packed. That room was packed with all of these people who loved her. And it was, it was wonderful to see that because there are times where I feel like um, she went through a lot as a science fiction writer. She was such a pioneer, and when you're a pioneer of something, you just deal with things. There's, there's a loneliness 